have closed two-thirds of our coal-fired plants and by 2040 we hope to have closed 100% of them. Moreover, we are working to ensure that by 2030, 70% of our energy matrix will be based on clean, renewable energies. This figure will increase until it reaches almost 100% in 2050. As evidence of this desire to and commitment, we wish to share with you that in 2021 we will have inaugurated more sun and wind energy capacity than we had inaugurated in the whole of our history. But it's not enough to reduce our carbon footprint. We must be more ambitious and ensure that our efforts to produce clean renewable energy also crosses borders and helps other countries to meet their own decarbonisation goals. We are therefore deploying green hydrogen, which is clean, renewable energy, whose production makes the most of our geographical assets, oh, the high and constant solar radiation of our deserts, and the strong and constant winds in Patagonia. Nature has therefore given us the potential to produce over 70 times the energy which we currently need, thus avoiding the release of millions and millions of tonnes of carbon dioxide every year. Green hydrogen is the energy of tomorrow, which in Chile we are producing today. In addition to these initiatives, I wish to highlight, first, the electrification of our public transport system. Santiago City is the only city outside China, is the city, the city outside China with the greatest number of electric buses in the country. Secondly, the protection of oceans and biodiversity, including the first marine protected area in the high seas and a marine protected area in the Antarctic. Thirdly, protection of the forests, including the planting of over 230,000 hectares of forests in 10 years, particularly of native species. Fourthly, the circular economy, including banning the use of plastic bags and other plastic items. And above all, a change from a culture of waste to a culture of recycling. Each generation has its own challenge. Avoiding seeing the climate crisis becoming an environmental apocalypse is the mission of our generation. This is a question of life and death, because the survival of the human species on planet Earth is at stake. We must not forget that 99 out of every 100 species ever to have existed no longer exist today, and we do not wish to add the human species to this unhappy list. History, our children, our grandchildren and future generations will judge us not on our good intentions but on our actions and results in the face of this challenge. President, in recent years democracies have undergone a constant and gradual pro process of deterioration. All the international indices reflect this deplorable situation. There is one diagnosis but there are many reasons for it. In Latin America, as well as the endemic reasons of low economic growth, ex corruption, state inefficiencies, we are also facing the coronavirus pandemic and other diseases which are equally toxic and lethal for democratic, peace-loving societies. Ills such as the virus of populism the cancer of polarisation and the plague of political fragmentation. The virus of populism operates by promising demagogical and fantastical solutions it knows it cannot deliver on. And short-lived immediate satisfaction always ends up sacrificing the future and weakening progress as well as weakening democratic institutions and the rule of law. Polarisation leaves no room for agreements and com compromises. This true cancer infects the social fabric. It infects our institutions and injects intolerance throughout society. Finally, fragmentation, which consists of a trend towards an identity politics and individual causes or the causes of small groups, which makes it impossible to articulate and process the different, any differing visions or social demands and hampers agreements and governability. In our region, a new threat to democracy has also arisen, not from the outside, but from within. 
for many years, the threats came from military or subversive actions to snatch power from legitimate, democratically elected authorities. Today, the main threat comes from democratically elected governments who initially enjoyed legitimacy, legitimacy and who manoeuvre to remain in power, who subjugate the independence of other state powers, who co-opt the organs responsible for overseeing electoral processes and often crush opposition, resulting in open illegitimacy in their power. 32 years ago, Chile saw an exemplary transition to democracy. Over these last three decades, we have achieved not only a recovery of our democracy, but also a high level of economic growth and human development, a decrease in poverty and inequality, whilst always, always upholding freedoms and human rights for all our citizens. However, Chile has not been immune from the threats I was mentioning earlier. The social upheavals of 2019 included legitimate social demands from our citizens, but there was also an irrational, uncommon and unacceptable wave of violence. Despite the difficulties and pursuant to our long and beautiful democratic tradition, Chile was able to channel this social upheaval and its legitimate demands through a peaceful, institutional, democratic process in line with our constitution and the rule of law. Because we absolutely believe that the cure for the above-mentioned ills consists of more and better democracy. Today, following a transparent participatory vote, there is a constitutional convention in Chile, which is uh, made up with equal numbers of men and women and participation by representatives of our indigenous peoples. This convention will propose a new constitution to our citizens. This must be ratified or rejected by the citizens themselves through a vote which will be clean, transparent and democratic. Most Chilean people hope that this convention will put forward a text for a new constitution which can improve and correct anything that needs changing and can also incorporate better, greater equity and social justice, protect our freedoms, protect our republican tradition and the values of our society. President. Another challenge we are facing in the world is whether the current institutions constituting our international architecture have adjusted or not to the new global reality and whether they do respond to current and future challenges or not. Ever since the current international bodies were created last century, the world has changed radically and there has been a technological and digital revolution which drastically changed our ways of living, working, learning and relating. However, the backbone of the multilateral organisations has stagnated. International institutions currently require significant changes and a true recast to be adequate to today and the future. International organisations must combine two principles. First of all, the, the broadest possible participation to give them legitimacy. And secondly, a decision-making system which is not stymied by antagonism, vetoes, blocks, or and which sometimes makes it difficult to reach consensus, although that is so important. We must find new mechanisms to achieve the right balance between these values. Multilateral action is essential to protect democracy and security across the world, to achieve development and the well-being of our peoples, to protect the environment and tackle pandemics. At the same time, public awareness of procedures, debates and decisions and clarity in appointing staff are necessary for transparent functioning of these institutions. Ultimately, there is no better policy than an enlightened public and no better disinfectant than sunlight. I cannot conclude without a word about what the triumph of the Taliban regime means, particularly for women and girls, who will have to live beneath its yoke. President, Afghan society is facing very difficult times, but the women in Afghanistan are in a particularly dangerous situation. 
Right now, as we speak, there has been a return to power by those who in the recent past wished to prohibit women from education, to deny their basic rights and freedoms. People who considered that the world had to be a world of... Uh, uh, they wished to impose upon them forced marriages. They wanted to guarantee impunity for those vibes, guilty of sexual violence against women. Attacks upon women in Afghanistan are attacks against women across the world. And we cannot, the United Nations cannot, be aware of this and then sit back and watch, paralyzed by res bureaucratic restrictions or political divisions in the Security Council. We must unite to work to protect them and restore women their full freedoms and rights, because the cause of women in Afghanistan is a cause for the whole of humanity. I wish to conclude my words by expressing our satisfaction at the contributions that Chile has made with great efforts to in recent times. For example, these contributions include our contribution to the Declaration of Human Rights, which is the cornerstone of our civilization, our active promotion of democracy, freedoms and human rights across the world. We are also proud of our contribution to protecting the Antarctic, which is the world's last bastion.